Okay. So these are our fabulous college panelists that we have here this evening. And to get us started, I have it in alphabetical order by the name of the school. Um, I'm going to ask each college panelist to introduce themselves, tell us a fun fact about your university, and then um, the first question of the night will be for, sorry, my kids are really, for all the college um, panelists to answer. Um, and so that question is to please give us some insight about how you review applications and what you are looking for in the college application process itself, because that does uh, tend to look a little different in every school, and it's a, it's a very popular question we get. So I'm going to ask that, again, each college rep answer a little fun fact about your college or university, um, and then answer that question about insight about how you review applications at your college or university. So Brad, we'll start with you at American University. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, hopefully you all can hear me okay. Let me know if you can't. My name is Brad Bazo. I'm an assistant director of undergraduate admission at American University in Washington, DC. A fun fact about AU is we were the first university in the United States to reach carbon neutrality. And we actually reached that goal ahead of our uh, intended schedule. At um, to clarify, you wanted us to talk about the review process after we finish our fun fact, yes? Perfect. So at AU, we complete a holistic review. Um, I'm sure you'll hear that repeated by a number of my colleagues this evening. And a holistic review means that we're looking at all aspects of the student's application. So we're going to look at both the quantitative information of the student's transcript, their standardized test scores if they are submitting them, and also the qualitative information. So the student's personal essay, letters of recommendation, and their resume slash activity report. And we do that holistic review because we want to paint a comprehensive picture of how your student will fit both uh, in the academic sense with American University, but also in the community and the personal sense with the university as well. And that holistic review helps us ensure that we are recruiting and enrolling students who are demonstrating the impacts that they have on their communities around them uh, through the activities that they do outside of the classroom, and also that they are going to be prepared for the rigorous demands of college level coursework as well. So that holistic review process ties all of that together and helps us make an accurate read of our students when we're going through the admissions review process. I think I'm up. Is that correct? Um, but I can see Brad, so hopefully people can see me. Um, I'm Tammy Wolfson. I'm from St. Mary's College of Maryland. Um, not necessarily a fun fact, but I always make sure that I point out that we are a public school. We get our name from our location in historic St. Mary's City, um, but we are small, so we're a little bit different. Um, but our fun fact is probably um, we offer underwater archaeology at our school. Um, so it's pretty popular class for non-majors, <laughs> um, just for, to, you know, for the heck of it. We are on the water. We are in a historic port. So there's all kinds of artifacts that have fallen off of ships over the years sitting at the bottom of our river. Um, so you can get scuba certified in the pool and go out and dig up historical artifacts. Uh, so pretty cool. Um, in terms of the application review process, we are pretty similar to American. We are very much holistic. We look at absolutely everything. There is no point when we stop um, reading an application, say this is a clear admit or this is a clear deny or this is a clear anything. Um, we read absolutely everything and we're very much concerned with um, who the student will be as part of our campus community as well. Again, I was saying we're small. So, you know, within a small community, each person is going to have a big part. Um, I think one of the questions, part of the question was, um, do we use committee-based review? And we do. We began this year, um, meaning that more than every application is read in a team. Um, so the territory manager, the person that's assigned to that territory is always part of the team and then another person. Um, so the idea is that the territory manager will know the schools really well, um, know the expectations, know what courses are offered, but they won't all, they won't get too wrapped up in sort of um, predetermined uh, notions when you've got another person who's a fresh eyes on it. Um, so that is how we look at applications. Uh, 
Hi, can you hear me? Awesome. My name is Becca Helaney. I am a freshman admissions counselor at Towson University. The fun fact for Towson University is that we were Maryland's first teaching college back in 1866. Back then we only had 11 students. Nowadays we have about 19,000. So we have expanded. We also now have six total colleges. We are now a comprehensive liberal arts university, but education is still at the focus of what we do. Uh, talking about holistic review, I echo everything uh, that my uh, fellow panelists have said so far. Towson University also does holistic review. Uh, evidently, we are on a bit of a larger scale, so we break it up um, between counselors. All of us are trained on the same criteria. We all go through intensive holistic review workshops on pedagogy and best practices together uh, before we review each cycle, setting up our goals, and learning uh, how to ensure that we are not reinforcing our own biases when looking at large pools of applicants. We do read every document that is sent to us. So we will look at your common application essay, your activity sheet. Um, if you choose to submit test scores, we will look at those as well. Um, we are looking to consider your uh, context within your school. So not only you as an applicant, your individual experiences, but also that in the context of what courses were available to you, um, trends in your academic history, what extracurriculars you partook, and what um, other uh, things were happening within your family, jobs, other extracurriculars. So I would encourage students to tell us everything that there is to know about you. We want to know about you as a three-dimensional person, not just your list of criteria on a page. Uh, we do split territories between managers. This uh, year, I am the Montgomery County Public School representative. But similar to, um, as my colleague said, we also do review together as a group. It's not committee-based, but we refer to each other very, very frequently. All righty, I guess it's my turn based on this slide. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jua Howard. I'm an assistant director uh, for the also funded graduate admissions at the University of California, Berkeley, which is located in Northern California, about 20 minutes outside of San Francisco, just in case uh, everyone's not familiar with uh, kind of our location. A fun fact about us, uh, probably one of my favorite is that we have added about, we've added around, I think we're at 16 elements to the periodic table that have come to Berkeley's campus over the years more than any other school. So um, that to me really speaks to the research focus <laughs> at Berkeley. Uh, we think that's cool. So Californicum, Berkelium, just to name a couple. Uh, so that's one of my favorite fun facts. And just the admissions process, pretty much similar to what everybody else said. We're probably kind of a combination of a couple, probably a little closer to what Rebecca just talked about for Towson, where it's very much holistic. Um, we are definitely looking at everything that is provided to us within the context of your respective school. Um, we do read by territory. Um, we have groups that read so that we're very knowledgeable about that context. Every particular applicant will receive a minimum of two separate reviews. And then we go through a whole other kind of different sets of quality control and filters that we go to to actually build the class. Um, similar to Rebecca, we with the amount of applicants we have, we definitely do not read in committees. There is no way uh, we would get through um, within the time frame that we have. So, but again, we do have a lot of training. We actually train throughout the year. We have a lot of bias training and a lot of things that we do to keep everybody on track through the entire process so that we are being as fair as possible um, to all of our applicants. And that's to me something I very much value. I will see a couple of things that are different about our process. Um, one, we are test free or more commonly known as test blind. So we do not consider the SAT or ACT. That is not a part of our process. And that is not only at Berkeley, but the entire University of California system. So if you're applying to Berkeley, LA, Irvine, wherever, that will be the same. So that's a big difference that we shifted to a few years ago. We use the use University of California application. So we're not on the Common App. We're not on any other app. We have our own application. And then letters of recommendation are not a part of our process. Berkeley is the only campus that will use them, and we have to request them from you. So it's not just the common part of the application. So just some, some differences to our process, um, just to keep in mind as you go through this and to give you a, a good sense of some of the nuances as we talk, each of us, about kind of differences of our different campuses. And um, I think that's my time. <laughs>
Well, it's not fair that I have to go after Jua. That's not our, I'm not, hi all, I'm Matt Wilcox. I'm the Senior Assistant Director for Admissions for the University of Georgia. I work out of our office in DC and I cover the Mid-Atlantic States. And we don't have any special parking spaces for Nobel laureates or part of the periodic table named after me or anything. But the University of Georgia was the first publicly chartered university in the United States of America. We were chartered in 1785. Uh, which makes us the birthplace of public higher education at you um, in America. Uh, we, I'm, my colleagues have done a fabulous job of talking about holistic or whole student review so far. And thank you for bringing up bias training. That's a great note to all of us. We're going to go through that as we prepare for reading files to make sure that we can take ourselves out of it a little bit and really try and um, objectively look at students relative to our criteria and what's going to be the most effective uh, student on our specific campuses. So the University of Georgia, that's academics, that's grades, that's uh, what's on your, your rigor, what's the transcript. We do require test scores at the University of Georgia, SAT or ACT scores. Um, beyond that, though, we're looking at a number of things in students. We want to see involvement. We want to see leadership, work ethic and maturity and integrity and creativity and giving back to one's community and showing respect for people who are different from yourself. And all of that comes through in your co-curricular activities, your essays, your recommendations from your teachers and your counselors. And we read all of that to glean these things to get at those criteria that we're looking for. I'm sure uh, Marilyn will talk more about that sort of thing, but uh, that's who, uh, who, how we uh, review files. And I'm happy to be with y'all tonight. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin Henry. I'm the Assistant Director for Recruitment at UMBC. Um, a fun fact about UMBC is that although we are extremely close to BWI, when I first started, I actually drove there accidentally on my way home. Um, even though we're super close to BWI and Baltimore City, um, we have 450 acres of campus, and it is almost entirely a walking campus. So you actually can't drive a car through campus if you tried. Somebody would certainly try let's kind of try and stop you, um, but it's a beautiful campus. It's really green and open, um, but you still have all the access to the city that you might enjoy on the weekends and that kind of thing. So that's our fun fact. Um, in regards to how we review applications, I don't want to spend too much time reiterating what my colleagues have said because it is very similar. Um, for us, we're looking at everything from the courses you've selected to the weight to your academic trend, all the things, along with everything else that you're sending to us, letters of rec, um, test scores if you're sending them. We haven't announced our testing policy for 2024 and beyond, so stay tuned for that. Um, but yeah, it's a comprehensive review. Applications get multiple eyes um, from counselors to assistant directors to directors in the office. Um, so we're really trying to give students the best review that we can um, and build our class as best we can along the way. everyone. My name is Alyssa Jones. I am a freshman admission counselor here at UMD. And one of my favorite fun facts about UMD is that we have a fully functional farm on campus with dairy cows, and we actually make our very own ice cream on campus. The Maryland Dairy, if you're ever on UMD's campus, highly, highly encourage you to go to the Maryland Dairy and get a scoop of ice cream. It is delicious. Um, and again, very similar to what everybody else has said in terms of our review process. We also employ a holistic review process. So just like all of my other colleagues have said, we are reading every single document, every single piece of information that you're submitting with your application. I like to tell people that we're trying to get an idea of not just who you are as a student, but who you are as a person as well. Um, again, like everyone else has said, to try and figure out how you're going to fit into our campus. Um, we also do not review by territory. Applications are randomly assigned for the first review, and they are read a minimum of two times, but often many, many more times than that by counselors, assistant directors, directors. Applications get many, many eyes on them before a final decision is made, similarly to what everybody else has said. I'm happy to be here today. Great to meet you all. I'm going to jump in here very quickly. Um, Miss Dunn is having, a, or Dr. Dunn is having some issues getting in here. So we're trying to get her into uh, into this Zoom call right now. Okay, thanks, Miss Carr. 
Okay, so the way um, the rest of the evening will go is I've broken up the questions um, into several different parts. Um, we're starting with the academic questions. So really breaking down how each rep shared, how they view um, and what they look at when they're um, reviewing applications. We're gonna break down exactly what they talked about um, and ask specific de details about you know, the letters of recommendation, testing, and as you heard, it's, it varies um, based off of each college. Um, and so we're going to have several parts. Financial aid is another part, the essay, um, and Ms. Carr and I will be um, seeing the evening. Um, and again, that was the only question that will be addressed to the entire panel. Um, and other than that, I will uh, direct these questions to each panelist and if again there's a, a vastly different response please feel free jump in panelists and and share your input from your school um if you have any questions parents go ahead and put in the chat um and you can direct it to the name of the college if if you prefer so that that particular college panelist um, can respond to you Okay, so my first question was actually for Wake Forest, but they are not here. So um, <laughs> tr she's trying to get in here. Um, so uh, whichever panelists would like to respond. Um, the second question on, on the screen is, what do you look for on the student's transcript? Do you consider their number of AP classes taken? Um, we often are asked, you know, Ms. Markowitz, do I, how many AP classes do I need to take to get into X college? And so I always say it doesn't really work that way. So if a college panelist um, would like to answer that question, that would be really wonderful. I can go ahead and answer for Towson University. First and foremost, when looking at a transcript, I look at trends in the actual grades. So looking at from ninth to usually when applicants apply, they have up through 11th grades, sometimes a first semester of senior grades, and then later on will receive transcripts from spring. Uh, but I'm generally looking at trends. So is there a dip at any point? Is that dip accounted for by something that happened in the world, uh, like the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, is it related to, to anything in the applicant? personal history that I might read about. But then also I'm looking at the specific um, school. So I know stats for my territory. I know stats for each of the schools in terms of what uh, number of AP classes or honors classes are offered, uh, what the average number of AP tests uh, is taken by students. But I don't um, hold those statistics against the merits of those trends that I saw. So first and foremost, I'm looking at uh, trends in an applicant's history how they did in school, um, how it changed. And then second, I'm looking at rigor um, to determine how competitive that applicant might be. Thank you so much, Becca. Um, the next question is for um, UC Berkeley. So can you tell us Shua, about the SRAR report? We've had a lot of students say to us, you know, can I have a copy of my transcript? Why do they need sure. to uh, self-report their academic record if the transcript is also sent. Got you. So um, I can't, well, I can't, I guess, respond to kind of why that decision was made from a systematic standpoint. That was way before my time. But um, I mentioned earlier that we utilize the University of California application. And so for that particular application, all information is self-reported information. Um, I would definitely think Part of it is just dealing with the amount of transcripts with the amount of applications we receive up front. Um, there's a lot of information that when you all self-report, we're able to kind of manipulate the data in different ways that fits our purposes. Um, as my colleagues mentioned about like grade trends, GPAs, things of that nature. One thing that we do in our process that may be a little different from some schools is we actually take grades that students provide to us and based on if they're AP, IB, honors level and so forth, calculate to come up with unweighted, an unweighted and weighted GPA for our purposes. We kind of even the playing ground, kind of playing field for our applicants since we have clearly a lot of applicants coming from a lot of different um, grading systems throughout the world. So that's something that we do. Not to mention something else that is very different about kind of in that calculation is that we do not consider your freshman year grades in that calculation. Freshman year is seen as a transitional year. So freshman year typically has a qualitative factor, definitely plays a part, but it will not affect your GPA for our purposes. So that's also very, very different. 
And so that also goes to kind of why would self-report it, why that fits our need, because we calculate in a very specific way. And our manually trying to do that, receiving hundreds of thousands of transcripts, that's not going to work. So for our purposes, it fits in that way. Um, and then, of course, we receive transcripts after a student is admitted and they decide to come to Berkeley. Then we will request those transcripts. And of course, at that point, we're dealing with we're dealing with a lot less transcripts, and we're able to then verify all the information that you provided to us in your application. So, you know, it has its purpose for kind of how we go about the process. Um, and I would also say in that filling out of the application it is extremely important that you follow your transcript to a T. Please make sure that whatever I'm going to see in your transcript is what you put in the application. If it's an AP class, designate it's AP, it's IB, it's honors level, it is college level. All of that is very important because that comes apart, comes in a part of the context that's about rigor, which is extremely important. We've all talked about context right now. So you really want to give yourself the credit that the work of the work that you're putting in. So that's really important. So really make sure that you are very detailed and thorough and filling out that particular section. So again, that you're giving yourself full credit. And as always, ask if you have questions, you guys have my email address, shoot me an email. And I will definitely help you along because I know it can be confusing. And that is why we're here is to help you through the process. Thank you. That was really helpful. Um, Joao, could you actually, I know this is off script, if you will, but how sure. much, what percentage of students uh, are accepted typically, you know, to, the, to UC schools that are out of state? Right now, I'll speak for Berkeley because it will vary per campus. That's definitely okay. where we differ. Um, I would say the amount that we accept will vary per year, actually, okay. as well. Because, for instance, I may have, let's say you all, let's say students from Wooten, one year we may admit five, the next year we may admit 15, you okay. know, where you have, you know, so that also will vary based on our pool. Contextually, again, we're looking at your school, what's available at the school and how your students are taking advantage of it. That looks very different every single year with the applicant pool. You all know this. Some, some, some of your classes are more competitive than others when you're dealing with students. So that will dictate who we're admitting. And then also looking at our, our larger applicant pool, that will play a part, not to mention what particular program our students applying to. So that's going to vary. What we're more so tasked to do, and probably a lot of public schools are like this, is that we don't really have a set quota that we have to take from a certain school or a certain state, anything like that. It's to maintain a certain percentage of in-state residents versus out-of-state, and we have to maintain that percentage. So for us at Berkeley right now, we're at like 76% in-state. Remaining 24% is pretty much split in the middle between 12% out-of-state domestic, 12% international students. So that's kind of where we have to stay, and that is a part of our thought process when we're building our class. And that for every UC, it's a little bit different, but that's our mindset across the UC system on maintaining that kind of ratio. Great. Thank you so much. And I know as we, con we continue, like Georgia, you can chime in about your stats because I'm going off script here. And, and same with the in-state schools, you can talk about, you know, how you look at um, your in-state kids, because that's who our kids are. All right. So let's see. Um, Georgia, Mr. Wilcox, do you look at a student's cumulative GPA, weighted GPA? And again, I know at UC Berkeley, they recalculate GPA, but do you do that at Georgia? And if so, how do you do that? Hi, thank you for asking. I think we're going to say a lot we're going to echo each other a fair amount tonight, and I'll start by saying that the answer to almost everything in college admissions should begin with it varies or it depends, because I think if each of us answered each of these questions, you'd get a different answer from each of us. So um, we at the University of Georgia, we do recalculate every student's GPA. We do a uh, core academic weighted for AP or IB uh, recalculated GPA for every student, and that works for us. So we are looking at that. I will say one of my colleagues mentioned when we're looking at transcripts, we're looking beyond those numbers. So we do a recalculated GPA, but I'm really looking at your whole transcript. So I want to see what classes you've taken, again, in the context of what's available to you in your school, in your community. And then I want to see any trends or anything going on there. So yes, we do a recalculated specific weighted GPA, but uh, we look at more than that in those grades. Is that uh, Brad from American? Do you guys recalculate GPA or how do you use your GPA? 
That's a great question. So um, we definitely will look at the students um, cumulative and or weighted GPA. We take what the school reports to us. And the only circumstance in which we would recalculate a student's grade point average is if the school uses above a 5.0 scale or if the student has changed between different school districts within the course of their high school education. So let's say that you went from a private school to a public school. Those institutions likely have different grading scales. So to keep everything even, we'll take a look at your grades across the board and then recalculate the grade point average from there. And then I think somebody in the chat asked, how do you recalculate GPA? Um, I can speak to our process and I assume this is slightly similar. Uh, to what the other schools do. Um, we have a matrix in which we can enter in the credits assigned to each grade value. So uh, we calculate or count up the number of A's that a student has for that particular year, plug it in, B's, plug them in, so on and so forth. And then once all of that information has been entered, the system will then calculate a new grade point average from that information. Thank you so much. And thank you for keeping up with the chat. There's no way I can do that. Thought I could, but I can't. <laughs> All right. So over at Towson, what is the importance of extracurricular activities, leadership positions, and community service in the admissions process? We are often asked as counselors, you know, how many clubs should I join? Like, what should I, <laughs> what should I put on my resume? And we're like, well, it's not the, the number. It's what's the importance and the meaning behind joining those clubs. So if you could speak to that. Absolutely. Thank you. So at Towson University, part of what holistic review means, uh, as we've talked about, is that we are looking at who you are as a student, not only that, but as in a whole person. Uh, for Towson University specifically, the big question we're asking when reviewing students for admission to the university is if given the tools needed for the student to succeed here, would they have a positive and productive impact on our educational and social community on our campus? So uh, we, I encourage students to tell us all about the things that they do outside of the classroom. Um, we do care about it, and that is a, a strong portion of your application, or it can be, but part of that bias training is also recognizing that some students, many students, um, may not have the resources to know what can go on an activity sheet. So at the same time, we recognize that if a student has left their activity sheet blank, that doesn't necessarily mean that they haven't been working or caretaking or doing something super neat in their own free time that they don't think is worth telling us about. So as one of my uh, colleagues says, I will quote her, she says, well-rounded activities and a well-written essay cannot raise an application from the dead but it can heal the sick. So I encourage you to tell us anything. Nothing is too big or too small. We wanna know about you. Um, the worst we can do is not consider it if it's something that is irrelevant to who you are as a portion of this community, but we wanna know as much about you as you would like to share with us. Thank you so much. Okay, over at UMD, does it matter if you select a major when you're applying or apply undecided as far as your chances of getting in? Um, and do different majors have different standards and requirements? And can you tell us about the limited enrollment programs? Sure, yeah, this is a great question and a question that we get a lot. So we review all of our applications completely major blind. So that means whether you apply with a major or undecided, that's not going to affect your chances of getting admitted to the University of Maryland in any way. Same goes for our limited enrollment programs. Um, for those of you that don't know, our LEP majors are our most popular majors on campus. Um, essentially applying to an LEP major just means you're not necessarily guaranteed direct entry into your limited enrollment program of choice, but applying into an LEP major is still not going to hurt your chances of getting admitted into the university. Um, essentially, when students apply to one of our LEP majors, their application goes through two separate review processes, one for direct admission into the university, and then a secondary review for direct admission into their limited enrollment program major. Um, our LEP majors don't have any separate requirements per se. However, for, for instance, if a student is interested in engineering, then we, of course, would want to see very, very strong coursework and grades in STEM-based classes for consideration for direct admission into engineering. Um, so there's no separate requirements, but there are some things that we like to see, at least for direct admission into those LEPs. 
Thank you so much. And if there's ever, you know, a completely different answer at your school, you feel free to unmute and just interrupt and go for it. Okay, so UMBC, how do you feel about seniors who drop classes in the middle of their senior year? They've caught senioritis. <laughs> and how do they report this to you? That's a really good question. Um, and this is the time of year where we kind of start to see some of those instances crop up. Um, obviously, it's not an ideal situation, particularly for the student. Like if you're going through BC calculus and realizing you need to back out, um, that doesn't put the student in an ideal situation academically or in terms of their just stress levels and learning progress, but if it does need to happen, if they do need to back out of a course um, or reshuffle their schedule, we recommend just letting us know before you make changes. Um, there's usually some kind of advice that we can give um, to kind of supplement whatever your counselor has been telling you. Um, and then obviously sending us um, updated transcripts when that change is made. So don't wait until you know June for that final transcript to tell us that you've shuffled your senior course schedule. We need to know as soon as that change has happened. Um, so reach out to your counselor. Um, we're you know, willing to work with you as you move through that. We know that wasn't the plan, um, but life happened. And so definitely reach out in advance. And this definitely varies from school to school. I think UMBC is very um, uh, kind of like forgiving on that end of things. There are some very selective schools that might be more stringent about it. So again, reach out before you make changes. Okay, this next question is for both American and St. Mary's College of Maryland, just to get two different perspectives, um, because we do get this question a lot, to comment on how you view world language credits and the number of years you would like to see on a transcript. So Montgomery County Public Schools requires now students, except actually these 11th graders, to take two years of uh, the same world language, but not for our current 11th graders. Um, but a lot of our students will take that in middle school um, and, and be able to graduate because they've earned those two credits in middle school. So can you speak to um, what how, how you look at that as far as uh, world language credits? Should they be taking more in high school or what do you look at there? Sure. Tammy, I think I spoke last. So if you'd like to, to sure. go first on this one, go ahead. Sure. So we are a state school, so we certainly can't require um any more than the state requires to graduate um so we're not going to necessarily penalize a student for not taking more um you know it's always going to be in the context of like what did they do instead um what, what kind of courses you know if a student really loves history and they took lots of history courses um that being said we do have a graduate uh, language requirement to graduate from St. Mary's. So they are going to take a language placement test. Um, you know, I see a lot of kids that have four years, but they stopped in ninth grade. Um, so it's kind of old. Um, so they're going to have to take, so it's it's almost a little bit counterintuitive. If you don't love language, you almost might want to take more of it <laughs> so you can place out. Um, but there also are also a lot of fun ways to take that language requirement in college because you can do things abroad and stuff like that. So we don't um, require any more than what's required to graduate. But, um, you know, we want you to, again, always be doing something with those slots, I guess I would say, um, if you're not taking language. And then on the American University side, uh, to preface, this kind of goes back to the a question about applying specifically to a major or applying undecided. All of our students that apply to American will put an intended major on their common application, but we don't actually use that to direct enroll into any of our majors or the schools or colleges that we have at the university. And that plays into this next question um, because we will require that our students graduating from high school have at least two years of world language credit. However, we don't use that uh, progression within that language after those years have been completed to either support or detract from a student's application. So if we see that you continued in your language into advanced study, that's fantastic, um, but it's not going to be a benefit to your application. And if you only took the two years and didn't go any further, that's not going to detract from your application. Um, I think somebody mentioned our ASL courses um, viewed against spoken languages. I can speak for American University. We do count 
ASL as a foreign, uh, satisfying that foreign language requirement, um, but I can't speak for any co other colleges or universities, so I'll leave that up to uh, my peers. And then if you did happen to take those language courses in middle school, which we do commonly see, or at least I commonly see um, from my students applying in Maryland, those still count. So those middle school courses generally were taken uh, within language at the high school level. Your students just took them earlier, so they still would count towards those high school graduation requirements. Thank you. And and um, most colleges that I know of as well do accept American Sign Language. Um, but I tell students and families all the time, you can always go to every college website under admissions, undergraduate requirements, and it does list requirements in order to apply. Or you can email all the fabulous college reps. They're always willing to help um, and they're just wonderful to chat with. Okay, we have um, Dr. Dunn, she's here. I'm so excited to have you here this evening. Welcome, representing Wake Forest University. Um, if you uh, don't mind, you know, just introduce yourself, tell us a fun fact about Wake Forest, and then um, I'll let you dive into the question, which is our students have many options their senior year, including a full course load with seven classes. They can enroll in our dual enrollment program by taking courses at our local community college called Montgomery College, um, and they can also partake in an internship um, experience, um, or they do work actually as well uh, during the school day as well. So how do you view these options when you're looking at the applications and transcripts? Absolutely. Well, good evening, everyone. I appreciate your grace um, and technical difficulties this evening. So I'm super excited to see all of you and all of your wonderful questions. Um, and a fun fact about me and, and Lake Forest, but honestly, Winston-Salem, is that we're home to the Krispy Kreme donut, y'all. So um, I think that's always something that we like to appreciate being in the South. We don't run on Duncan in North Carolina. Um, and so I always like to share that. Um, but in terms of your question, um, um, as it relates to balancing so much. And I know working with um, with graduates and current students of Wooten for several years at this point, I know that there is a lot of opportunities and also depending on the different academies, whether that's humanities or you're interested in STEM and research, there are lots of different opportunities there. Um, and I will say, you know, for us, it's all within context. And that's something that I've listened to my colleagues mention over and over. And of course, as um, Mr. Wilcox mentioned as well, you know, it depends um, in terms on, you know, you know, the particular program um, in, uh, to which a student is applying as well as um, the priorities of the institution. Now I can speak from a, a Wake Forest lens um, as a liberal arts university. Um, the beautiful thing about um, our process is that we're not admitting by nature. Um, and so that helped quite a bit in terms of having those specific courses that were mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, but I will say it, it also depends on what your ultimate goal is. And I know there's parents and students who are in the room. If you are wanting to, in lieu of taking an elective course in order to pursue an internship, we want it to be something that you want to do. We want you to be able to use it as an exploratory opportunity or even confirming an interest that you already have. I don't believe in my opinion in the conversations that I've had in committee processes is the role in which is it is it helpful to you? Is it something that is gonna be in alignment with your overall academic interest? Um, and that is okay <laughs> at the end of the day. I think the hard part when it comes down to it is actually, to be very honest within a selective admissions process is kind of taking the foot off the pedal quite a bit during the senior year. I think that's typically um, the conversations that we typically have. Um, however, at the same time, it doesn't mean that you have to maximize the maximum opportunities that you have either. And so we want it to be personal to you. We want you to challenge yourself, but also at the end of the day, we want you to have balance. We want you to be able to do things that are in alignment with what your interests are, not what we, you want us to see. Um, and so again, if you do take that part-time job. If you see that internship, we're going to see that. We're going to be able to look at your balance. And I wouldn't say it's a red mark in our evaluation process, but I'm curious to know if there's anyone else here in the room who also has some input. Any other differing responses from the panelists? No. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, UC Berkeley, please share how you view classes taking in the summer 
or through what we call our online pathways program to replace a grade on the student's transcript. Um, that's kind of a recent um, thing that, you know, in Montgomery County Public Schools, students can retake a course to replace an old grade, not necessarily an E, it could be any grade. Um, so how is that viewed? Um, it's not a bad thing. Um, actually, I think it's a positive, you know, as long as the program itself uh, is accredited, which is first and foremost for anything, it's accredited, something that you all will utilize in your graduation requirements. So if, as long as it's approved through the high school, um, then can you all hear me? Can you all yeah, hear me? We can. You just cut okay. out for a second. Okay. I, I was wondering. I thought I saw a message on my internet. So, so I apologize. So um, so as long as it's accredited, it's something that you all use at the school for graduation. It is a credit, you know, and you all take it, we're going to take it. You know, I think that goes back to the context. We're going to do whatever is going to be in the best interest of, of the student, starting with the context of what you all have available for them. And our calculation that I mentioned a little earlier about recalculating. If a student retakes a class, so let's say they got a poor grade, a C or a D in one course, and let's say they did retake that course in, let's say, the summer for this program, and they retake it, we re they retook it, we would take the more current grade. That would take the place of the bad grade. So that is something that we do consider in, in our calculation. So for us, it's a, it's a good thing. Um, because I think, again, it gives students a second chance to kind of get it right. Uh, I think we said earlier, there's no telling what students are going through when it comes to academics. And, and so anytime they have that additional chance to take those classes over, for us, it's a benefit. So for us, it's a positive. And we will, again, we will definitely give them credit retaking it. But again, it needs to be, it needs to match clearly what that course is. It needs to closely match it. Not something, it may be similar in subject, but not something totally different. It needs to match exactly what they first um, completed for us to then give them credit for the, for the newer grade. So I would chime in on that. I think one of the most important things is using say like the additional information section to tell us why they retook it. Did they retake it because they took too many advanced courses at once? Did they retake it because something was going on at home? Did they retake a B because they wanted an A? That's not necessarily a good thing. Are they going to not be able to deal with disappointment and imperfection when they get to college? Um, so, you know, in unless, I mean, not but more is always more. I mean, there's that, that additional information section is really underutilized and it's a great place to give, uh, to explain to us why and why lots of things, but definitely why we took a class. Yeah. And I'll throw one thing out after, uh, based on Tammy's point, which I wholeheartedly agree with utilizing the additional comment box. That is crucial. Um, I will also say for us, something that I suggest to students is we receive a lot of questions about kind of our A through G academic course requirements. And it's something that I mentioned to someone in the chat of like four years of English, three years of math, and so on. And students a lot of times have a lot of anxiety around, are they meeting everything? And I always try to stress to them, that's a guideline when it comes to out-of-state students. That's a California-based system. If we know that that varies per state, per district, and so forth for out-of-state students. So we don't hold them to that as far as eligibility. It is a guideline to see how are, are you best prepared. But I always tell students, let's say you don't have something and you're still trying to fit it in. You can take a college level class at any community college and so forth, three semester, four quarter unit. In our process, that's the equivalent of one full year in high school. A lot of students do not know that. So a lot of them are taking classes anyway. And so I let them know if you're taking, that may be a good way to knock out a full year, at least for our process, in addition to having that college level course. So I always throw that out there just because I don't think, again, that's readily known for students. And so that's always another option for kind of filling those academic subjects based on things that they're taking anyway at the college level, just that they enjoy. So I always think that's important to know. Thank you guys so much. Um, so this question is for University of Maryland, College Park. Um, we get this question a lot from parents um, and students. Does it benefit the student to share if they have a 504 plan with accommodations or an IP in their application? Um, and can you speak to that? Sure. So I think it definitely can. It sort of goes back to the holistic review process that I think everybody here has talked about multiple times. That can be that important context that gives us a better picture 
of who you are as a student and your academic history, especially if maybe you have lower grades in certain subjects. Um, it can provide that additional context and help fill in those gaps, but we, of course, would never want to force a student to disclose that if they don't feel comfortable disclosing those accommodations, 504 plans, IEPs, but I do think it can be helpful to provide additional context if you feel that it does help provide context to your academic history. So I think it can benefit, but only if the student feels comfortable sharing. And if I can add to yeah. that, just uh, this question comes up a fair amount. Usually parents are worried about putting anything negative in the application. And I think Tammy mentioned, and just now, um, we're looking for that context to understand your story and everything that's going on with you academically and beyond. And so nobody's going to hold it against you if you share this information. It's only going to be helpful for us to understand what's going on, and especially if there's a, a change academically, like you were diagnosed with dyslexia or something you know, in your second year of high school, and we see the grades change. That can really help us know why that happened. But nobody I've ever spoken with would have that as a negative for a student. That's really helpful. I'm glad you pointed that out. Okay, so moving on to um, SAT, ACT testing. Um, let's see, I think this one actually is for you, UGA, Matt. Um, with so many schools being test optional, what data points are you looking at now to determine their acceptance? And how do we know when to send in the SAT score, the ACT score, um, or does it hurt if the student doesn't send in a score? Of course, only if it's a test optional school. I may be the least, uh, uh, the worst person to answer this question on this panel. Uh, the University of Georgia currently is requiring SAT or ACT scores. The year that we didn't during the pandemic, uh, there are lots of great factors academically for understanding the likelihood of student success at a university level, including rigor given context of the school and grade trends within that. SAT and ACT are just another uh, academic factor that we can use for that. I love for my colleagues. Hi, this is Vert. He's my abuse and hound. Um, <laughs> hi, buddy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I would love for my colleagues to to jump in and, and talk about what they look for and when they would recommend sending a score versus not sending a score. But I, I think all of them will say that optional really means optional for places. It's not a trick. It's not a gotcha. We're going to think that if you didn't send us scores, we think they're low, unless you're Jua, in which case he doesn't want them at all. But uh, I'd love for my colleagues to, to, to chime in. I'm happy to provide some context and I, and I think Wake Forest is on kind of on the opposite side of the spectrum, um, having been test optional um, for a little bit of time. I think this is year 15 for us in terms of being in a top test optional environment. Um, and it's quite interesting. And so over the years, we've noticed that, you know, the consistency of students pursuing a test optional um, opportunity has remained, you know, even consistent during the pandemic. So about 60% of students submit an SAT or an ACT score. Um, but when you look at enrolled students within the context of Wake Forest, um, a little over 50% of students actually submitted a test score. So as you think about it, we actually kind of lean more proportionally to our students who are not submitting testing. Um, and to what uh, Matt mentioned earlier in terms of being truly test optional, I wanna echo that. Um, when you think about a test optional policy, it is very much another variable or another piece that you're adding to your academic profile. So we talked a lot about GPAs, we talked about rigor and other pieces this is adding another variable into this area. And so if you feel that that test score represents your academic profile at large, looking at it from that perspective, that may be a really good reason to submit that test score. If not, then that's okay leave it out. Um, I will share with you some schools um, will still report your their middle 50% ranges for the ACT or the SAT in terms of um, those students who choose to submit testing. Um, at Wake Forest, we do not. Um, and the reason being is that we don't control for testing when we're making our evaluations through a holistic um, lens. So our SAT and ACT ranges are actually not concordant. They're not the same. And it has a lot to do with the fact there are multiple variables that we're considering when we're reviewing an academic um, profile of a student. And we don't want you all to be more confused, um, you know, as you're looking at those middle 50% can be a little bit misleading at face value. So again, it's going to be depends, um, but I would love to know if there are any others who also have some perspectives. 
So St. Mary's became test, op test optional prior to the pandemic, um, only like a year before. So we don't have the history that Wake has. Um, generally, our philosophy is that test scores won't hurt you, um, that if you feel like it gives us a piece of information that is helpful um, then to submit them. We, it truly does mean test optional. I mean, I've been on lots of Facebook groups throughout the pandemic where I hear parents, I took my kid to Indiana during the pandemic. I took my kid to Indiana to test and they wouldn't let them in because they didn't believe that we really meant test optional. And I think Mac Act issued a statement, but we do mean it. Um, I, I would say um, for us though, if, if there's, if a low test score comes in, say below our mid 50, um, we generally attribute it more to, um, what's the, like not have had as much counseling, you know, maybe they're a first generation student and they just automatically sent them then like a strategy. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but so we don't put a lot of, we didn't put a lot of weight into test scores before we were test optional. Um, it's three hours on a Saturday and it's not your whole academic, um, history. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, all right, Towson, what is a super score and do you super score? If not, how do you evaluate test scores when multiple scores are sent? And do you hold lower scores against students, which it sounds like the answer is no, but go ahead. <laughs> yes. Um, well, so first I'll answer what a super score is for both the SAT and ACT. A super score is the average of your best scores from each subject over multiple uh, test attempts. So your super score will never be lower than a single composite score um, if you take the SAT or ACT only once. So your super, your super score will not hurt you. Um, it will be the better of both of your attempts. Towson does accept and consider super scores for both the ACT and SAT. Uh, now speaking about Towson University specifically, uh, I will echo Dr. Dunn uh, summarized it quite perfectly. Towson University is officially test optional forever. We are very excited about this. That means that uh, you are welcome to send your test scores to us if you think you they are a good representation of who you are as a student, your academic record. If you choose not to send us your test scores during your application, we will not make any assumptions about why. Uh, this will not negatively impact your eligibility for scholarships, so you can only help yourself by sending us your scores. If you send us your test scores and maybe uh, they are not the strongest part of your application, we'll just pretend like we didn't see them. So we're not asking students to gamble. Uh, we're not going to penalize you. You are welcome to send them to us. We will consider them. However, they will not count against you. It is only another data point in who you are as a student. Uh, personally, in high school, I was a terrible, terrible test taker that was not reflective of my potential as a student, as we all know about all of our students. So to you is test optional. Um, no test needed for scholarship or admissions consideration is the short summary. I will mention if you do choose to send your test scores to Towson University, they have to be submitted directly through College Board or ACT. I'm assuming that's the same for uh, most, if not all, institutions, but I will say it now. Uh, similar, same thing goes for your transcripts. If it's from community college or from your high school, we need them sent directly from the office, your counselor, the registrar, um, from a representative of the school or college board or ACT, letting you know that now in case you give it to us and we have to say thank you so much. This is exactly the right document. We need it from someone else. Yes, thank you so much. We do go over that with our seniors uh, at the beginning of the school year, but that's a really great point that families will need to log into the account and pay for those test scores to get sent out. All right. Um, the next question is for American University. Do you look at AP scores in the admissions process and when should AP scores get sent to the colleges or how are they viewed? Great question. So um, in terms of uh, American University's review process, uh, we will consider the AP scores if they are official but our students can also self-report their AP scores through the common application. So if a student has self-reported their AP scores, I will look at that information when reading through the common application, but I take it with a grain of salt because it's not considered to be the official score. Um, if your official scores are submitted to us, they have a special place within our review form where I can verify the authenticity of that score. And I will use that information to 
I will use that information compared to what I'm seeing on the transcript from uh, AP courses that have been completed, just to see how you fared on the test compared to the grade that you earned on the transcript. That being said, the test score is not used in any of our modeling for the admissions process, like the SAT or ACT <laughs> score would be if you do choose to submit them. We are a test optional school, um, like many of my peers have mentioned, we've been test optional for more than 10 years at this point. Um, so the AP score is, again, not going to be included into that calculation of a student's admissibility like the SAT or ACT score would be. In terms of um, when should those scores be sent to colleges, that will be another matter of it depends on what the college is specifically looking for. Um, earlier can certainly be be better than later in making sure that the college has that information on hand if they do use it as part of their evaluation process. But as I mentioned, not all schools do. So it will come down to a case by case basis on whether that individual college or university would need that information or use that information in support of your application to the university. In terms of how those scores are viewed, um, in American universities case, we use those scores to determine what sort of college level credit you can receive from that AP course. So we do accept credit by exam. Generally, our students need to have earned a four or five on the AP test in order to receive college credit for that specific course. And we do publish the criteria for each of the AP courses that we accept on our website. So if you're curious about how you well you would need to perform in a specific AP test to earn that college credit, that is all publicly available. So I would definitely want to answer this one because it's pretty different. Um, we do not consider AP scores part of admissions. That is for credit for awarding credit. Um, if our school re received scores, they would go to the registrar's office. They would not go to the admissions office. Um, so we do look at APs in terms of students, the curriculum, we know what the curriculum is and the challenge and students um, having challenged themselves with that. There's also opportunities if they ha if students have taken a bunch of APs and done really well, they can put in the honors section if they're an AP scholar with distinction or whatever, that's going to show us, you know, that they've done a good job at mastering the material, um, but we don't look at the scores. Okay, thank you guys so much. All right, I feel like I haven't heard from UMBC in a while, so I'm going to direct this one to you. Can you talk to us about the college essay and what you like to see in an essay? Do you evaluate on the content, the student voice, or as a writing sample? Um, can you give us some examples of essay, you know, no-nos? <laughs> um, and should the parents write those essays for this for your, for their children? <laughs> Great questions. Um, so the essay, first and foremost, needs to be written by the student. Um, and one of the things I really try and stress as I kind of talk to students about um, essays and do essay workshops is that some students can get lost in the review process. So they write the essay and then they just keep having people review it. I really recommend trying to kind of tailor your, your panel down a little bit and kind of choose wisely who you're having review your essay. So maybe have a counselor review it and then maybe a parent or a friend and then put a stop to it. Um, one of the things that we're really looking for in the essay is the student voice. And as that essay is reviewed more and more by more people, it looks less and less like the student. So one of the things we're really looking for is we want to hear from you. It should feel like we're sitting next to you, you know, listening to you talk about your favorite topic or whatever it is you've chosen to write about, because um, we're trying to get a feel for you and how you're going to fit into our class. Like, what is it that drives you? What is it you're passionate about? Um, what is just a quirky part of your personality that you want us to know? There's like six different common app prompts. So you should choose what works best for you, what's easiest to write about, and take it from there. Um, in terms of essay no-nos, I think we talked about like the over review process, but also some students get lost in the, the details of whatever circumstance they're talking about. So 
one thing we talk about is tearing your ACL. We read a lot of essays about sports injuries and that kind of thing. If you're going to write about those kinds of topics, focus less on the nitty gritty logistical details of the situation and focus more on what you took out of that situation, what you learned from it, how you grew, um, how you approached the situation and that kind of thing. It should really be focusing on your personality, your perspective, um, and less on the how and the what of the, whatever you're describing. Thank you so much. Any other college panelists have some good examples they'd like to share? Um, I'll, I'll throw my two cents in really quickly. And, and, I, and I'll do this more so just because our essays are formulated very different in relation to let's say the Common App. University of California process, we have what we call personal insight questions. And they're short answer kind of questions where you've got around 350 words per response to work with. So they're just structured very different. And so um, to Caitlin's point, you know, a lot of that information is still dead on. But a lot of times with ours, I have to tell students, you can't approach them like a longer essay. You've got to get to the point um, and kind of cut out the fluff. Um, really get to the heart of the matter very quickly. I would say um, one thing that I always tell students to do specifically with our format is try not to be, and this may not be in other situations, but try not to be too creative. I have students who are wonderful creative writers and they really wanna take us on a ride, 350 words, it's not too long to do that answer the question. And I say that because a lot of students miss the mark. And literally by the end of it, we've learned nothing else about you except you're a great creative writer, but I have not learned more about you as a person. Um, and a lot of times we're confused. We don't know where you're going with it. So I say that to say, this is all about getting to know you. I try to keep it very simple. So try to steer away from that. In addition, please don't talk about someone else too much. I don't need 90% of the essay about your mother or a mentor. That is wonderful. And they should definitely be a part of it. But that should be a good 10% setting it up, 90% about you. So really make sure that you are keeping the focus on you. This is all about you. So those are just a couple of other tidbits that I threw out there, but more so because, again, you don't have as much time to really develop your essays and, and because of the format on the University of California application. So I just want to really kind of get students in a different mindset. If you're applying to one of our campuses, you kind of have to shift your thought process and how you structure your responses. So be very mindful of that. And that's also a learning tactic as you're applying to various schools, being mindful of what we're asking, what are those word limitations, um, so that you are shifting. It's not just a generic response and you're putting in the same response that you put in other schools. And I'm like, you're not talking about our campus, or I have a lot of kids who may talk about UCLA, which is fine. But, you know, if you really want to come to Berkeley, what is it about Berkeley? And so you need to think about that, or maybe you need to be very cognizant of making it a little bit more general so that you're not pinpointing any particular campus. That's just the thought process. So just a few things to kind of keep in mind as you go through it as well. Those are some excellent tips. Thank you guys for sharing all of that. Um, we have seen that too, and it's really helpful to have you also emphasize the importance of that. All right, I think it's time where I'm turning it over to you, Mrs. Carr. All righty, so on to admissions. And thank you all. You have been unbelievably informative this evening, so thank you very much. So I would like to direct this next question, please, to Dr. Dunn. We know that all schools offer different admission deadlines. Please talk about the options that your school offers, early action, early decision, ED2, restrictive early action, priority, rolling, and, and so on. And if students apply ED or REA, regular early action, talk to us about how that limits other applications. Now, this is something new too to add on to that question. Recently, I heard that the Rochester Institute of Technology is offering something called ED Friendly. And I'm curious if that may be in the works for you all too. So Dr. Dunn, if you could answer that, it would be much appreciated. Thank you, Ms. Carwauza. Um, 
<laughs> as we think about it. And um, first, um, of course, defining, you know, EAED and restrictive EA as well. So EA um, typically stands for early action, um, which essentially means that you are applying to that institution as your top choice institution, but it is not a binding agreement with that institution. So if you are admitted, you are not committed to enroll at that institution. It's just saying that you are very interested. This is your top choice school. We, would, um, we also have institutions that are restrictive um, in terms of their early action opportunities. And it's the same in some ways. However, because that institution is your top choice school, you are not able to apply to another school um, uh, with an early decision, perhaps an opportunity or another binding agreement. And then also some, of course, you cannot apply to another early action school um, either. And so it depends on the language that these institutions are using. So definitely um, look, do your homework in that particular setting. Early decision and early decision two, for example, are your binding agreements. So you're, you are committing to that institution to enroll in that, to, um, at that institution if you are admitted. And after that, you are required to withdraw all applications from other schools that you may have submitted through a non-binding agreement. Um, and so this is your almost like your marriage, as we like to say, um, in, um, in admissions. You are committing to that school, have done some research, and, and you know that this is the place you want to be. Um, now, we have many different priority deadlines. Some allow students to have priority opportunities for scholarships, others, depending on where they are in the process, maybe for housing opportunities. And you also have other processes as well in terms of rolling, where um, their missions decisions are actually uh, released in a rolling basis. And so you're not having to wait, you know, nine months after you submit your application um, to receive an admissions decision. You may have two weeks, four weeks weeks, six weeks, for example, and every school has a different opportunity there. Now, I will say from the lens of Wake Forest, we are a school that has three decision plans. We have early decision one, early decision two, and regular decision. Regular decision is non-binding, no top choice indicator there. But we're also a school that has a rolling early decision one process, which is very rare. I think we may be the only school that does it um, in a lot of ways. Um, and it's interesting with the rolling early decision process, our application for all students will open up on August 1st. Um, but we also have students who know that they want to attend Wake Forest and they are excited to share with us their experiences from ninth through 11th grades, and they're able to, to apply to us maybe mid, late August, all the way up through November 15th. And this past year, we were able to release four waves of early decision um, uh, decisions to our students. And so students who applied in August receive an answer from us in late September. September submissions receive an answer from us um, in late October and so on through mid-December through an early decision binding agreement. Um, early decision two at Wake Forest is not rolling. Um, and so with that, every student has opportunities to uh, submit their application by January 1st, and students will learn at the same time their admissions decision, which is typically mid-February, February 15th, um, around that date. Now, I can share with you that with the information that Ms. Carr mentioned about RIT, um, ED friendly is really interesting. I'm actually quite curious about it. So I'm curious to know if my, uh, my colleagues are thinking about that as well. Um, but I will say, you know, just to, to, to not overlook the other question as it relates to if there are any limits. Um, uh, common questions that we have are, how many students are you admitting um, through early decision one and two? What does that look like for your institution? Is it the same every year? And I know that's gonna be talked about later, but those are questions that I encourage you um, to consider as you're navigating this process. But I wanna open it up to my colleagues as well. Yes. I guess I just wanted to get on my soapbox for a second and say that <laughs> early decision is a way to express to get the earliest possible answer and express your that that school is your first choice. 
It is not a way to beat the odds. It is not a way, to, it's not a strategy. It's not a way to increase your likelihood of being accepted. Um, even at most schools where the admit rate is higher on ED, a lot of that piece is special populations like athletes and things like that that are driving that admit rate. So it's not the same apple to apple kind of person. Um, I've heard the sentence come out of so many mouths. I'm not sure if I'm gonna apply ED to X school or Y school. If you're saying that you should not be applying to either of those schools ED. It is because they are your first choice and I'll get off my soapbox now. But I used to be in the high school and and I think it's a really important point to make. Thank you. I I, I agree. Does any do, do any any other people on our panel would anybody else like to comment? Nope. Okay, I think we've worn you out this evening, so let me continue. <laughs> um, the next question is actually um, specifically to Alyssa at UMD. Um, is there an advantage to applying early? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> so UMD, we do not have early decision, but we do have early action. So again, early action is non-binding. You are not legally bound to commit to UMD if you get admitted through our early action deadline. However, we actually encourage every single student who's interested in applying to UMD to apply by our early action deadline. It's November 1st. It is the only application deadline that is in the pamphlets that we hand out to students. It is the one that we advertise the most. November 1st is the date to remember for us. And if you apply by our early action deadline, you are automatically considered for all of our merit scholarships, all of our special programs, you get priority consideration for admission. So yes, there is a huge advantage to applying early for us. And I think for a lot of schools that have early action deadlines, if you are able to submit your application by that early action deadline, definitely encourage you to do so because if there's an early action deadline, there is definitely a benefit to applying to that early action deadline. Even if the benefit is just getting your decision back early, that seems like enough of a benefit to submit your application by that deadline. So yes, early action deadlines pretty much always have a benefit. Thank you very much. Would anybody else like to chime in on that? No? Okay, so this next question is Again, I, I were specifically asking Dr. Dunn again um, for the simple fact that this is a question with regards to demonstrated interest in the admissions process. I don't think a lot of our schools on our panel this evening track demonstrated interest, but I was wondering if you could please let us know, is it important to demonstrate interest in the school by perhaps visiting before applying or interviewing or what have you? you could speak to that, that would be wonderful. Of course, of course. And so demonstrated interests are different ways in which a student can have contact with our institution. So that could be in the form of a campus visit, a phone call to your admissions representative. Uh, it could also be an email or attending um, a virtual event that we're hosting or even a high school visit um, at Wooten as well. And so um, there are lots of different ways you can have contact uh, contact with us. Um, I will say at, at Wake Forest, we do consider demonstrated interest um, as, a, as a component of our um, evaluation process. Um, I believe it's very important to know though um, that a student who chooses to visit campus and has that opportunity to enjoy it and, and to um, be in that setting, that is a wonderful thing and also recognizing that not all students are able to make it to our campus. And so we consider any type of contact in an equitable fashion, even as we're using I and mean, evaluating our students um, in that manner. Um, I will say beyond the role of admissions, I think it can be very helpful um, for families to visit a college campus if you have the opportunity, whether that is if you have a list and you wanna narrow it down. I know in North Carolina, we have the I-40 corridor where everybody goes through college tour in our area. 
Um, and so it's a very easy way to get a lot of schools in a very short period of time or to pair it with the family vacation or if you are visiting family in other states or different regions or even, you know, in the DMV where you all are as well, take advantage of that. Um, and I will also see too, it's just helpful to confirm or deny the type of environment that you're seeking. Um, so that way you're able to, to be able um, to have an informed decision when that, those decisions come in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and on to, um, to what the, the next question is actually directed towards Matt at UGA and Alyssa at University of Maryland. Could you please tell us about your honors college, your scholars programs, your special programs, and et, et cetera, offered at your school? Just to confirm, who is that question directed to? I'm sorry, it's directed towards Matt at UGA and it's directed towards Alyssa at UMD. But Caitlin, if you'd like to answer on it too, please feel free to, okay? Alyssa and Caitlin, please. Um, so I can, I can start. Um, in regards to our kind of specialty programs, we have an honors college of about 500 students. Overall, we have 11,000 undergraduate students. So that's a very small fraction of our student population. Um, these students can live together. They can take special honors like lectures together throughout the year um, and really get to know the faculty. So the faculty teaching these lectures had to actually apply just to teach the special seminars. So they're super engaged. You get to know them on a first same basis, you do research with them. It's really just a way to make the campus feel really small, even though we are a mid-sized school. Um, and then we do also have seven scholars programs. They are tailored towards specific populations. Um, so students who want to do MD PhDs or women in technology, um, artist scholars, they're very small cohorts, usually 15 to 35 students coming in every year. They come Come in as a cohort and stay together all four years and they receive a scholarship for being at UMBC. Um, some of these scholars have gone off to develop the Moderna vaccine and do other incredible things. So there's really great outcomes for these students. Um, if that's something you're interested in at UMBC or any other school, reach out to your admissions counselor so we can prep you for application processes and that kind of thing. And for UMD, I very briefly touched on our special programs when I was talking about our early action deadline. Um, we do have a number of what we call our living and learning programs, like our honors college, like our scholars program. Um, essentially, these programs are called living and learning programs because students will live in the same dorm. So for instance, they'll live in the honors dorm, and then they'll take some of the same classes together, like the honors coursework together. Um, and what's pretty unique about UMD is students don't even have to list an interest in any of these programs on their application. There's no separate applications for any of these programs. They don't have to write additional essays or anything. As long as students apply by our November 1st deadline, they are automatically considered for every single one of these living and learning programs. So they're automatically considered for our Honors College, for College Park Scholars, which is very similar to the Honors College. It just has a little bit more of like a service learning element built in. Um, we also have another program called Civicus, which is entirely focused on service learning and community engagement. We have a program called FIRE, which is a first year research experience. So we have a lot of special programs and students are automatically considered for every single one if they apply early. Essentially, our reviewers just read through the application to get an understanding of what students' interests are and nominate them for these programs. And then they're reviewed for directed invitation into these programs as well during the review process. Thank you. Excellent. And generally, <clears throat> generally big schools, big state flagships and state institutions, when you're talking about an honors college or program, like Caitlin was saying, it's a chance to get that smaller, more intimate feel on the bigger campuses, uh, if that's something you're interested in. And the way that we evaluate those is gonna be different. Uh, some of ours, like uh, UMD, automatic review with early action. Some we have an application for. We have living learning communities, not programs at Georgia. So we're totally different than the Terps, but 
but otherwise very similar in that you know it's a smaller cohort there are some opportunities for students to live together that have similar academic interests and to get that closer more specific time with professors than maybe you might get at generally at the, the big state school thank you all very much so now we're going on to letters of recommendation, which we did discuss. You did discuss this pretty heavily a little while ago, but if you could reiterate, Caitlin, actually UMVC, the importance of the, the impact that a counselor letter of recommendation would have on your admissions decision for a certain student. Yeah, so in some cases, a letter of recommendation is kind of just affirming what we've gathered from the rest of the application, which is great. Um, if the student is performing, you know, in a high level academically, they're engaged, maybe that letter of recommendation is just telling us something about the student that maybe they forgot to put in their application or something that we just didn't know, um, some additional context about the student, which is always very, very helpful, especially when we're gauging fit. For other students who are kind of on the edge, sometimes those letters of recommendation are what I need to really rally for a student. Um, and I do wanna mention like every school has different requirements for these letters. Um, we don't require them, but we can take two optional letters. They don't have to come from counselors specifically. They can come from uh, bosses and coaches and mentors, um, other individuals who can speak to the student who are not the parent or guardian. Um, so we love seeing those extra perspectives, but we understand not everyone has those resources. Um, so if you can't send them, that is okay. Thank you. And then actually going on what you just said, um, I'd like to direct this towards Brad at American. Um, can students um, send in more recommendations than are required? As Caitlin had just mentioned, Oftentimes they, they're happy to receive additional, but how do you view that, um, Brad? Certainly. So at American, uh, to preface, at present, we only require one letter of recommendation. That would be from a teacher of the student's choice, but we're happy to accept more letters of recommendation from a student if they have additional recommendations to submit. Um, in any case, I would always urge quality over quantity, though, when it comes to those additional letters of recommendation. If a student sends several in that are and uh, more vague, we may not be getting more information than we already had available to support the student's application. So finding those individuals who can really speak to a student's academic capabilities or personal growth or potential uh, as a prospective employee or member of the campus community uh, would be great individuals to tap on to submit those additional letters of recommendation. We, um, of course, Cannot speak from for every college or university, though, so I can't say that every institution will accept additional letters of recommendation beyond their minimum or maximum required number. And you should also clarify with an individual school if they have any limitations on the types of recommendations that can be accepted. But we're happy to accept recommendations from outside coaches or supervisors or employers or mentors. But again, that may not be the case for every institution. So doing that research and homework is a great point as has been expressed with many of the answers across the board so far. Thank you very much. And lastly, on our letters of recommendation, this is directed towards Becca Towson. Um, with regards to the teacher letters of recommendations, do you have a subject preference? Is it necessary for it to be a core subject? Um, and is it an 11th grade uh, preference? So Towson University does not require any letters of recommendation for admission, but we do have guidelines for if students do choose to submit them because we do review holistically. If there is a recommendation you would really like us to see um, that you think impacts your application, you can send it to us. However, it is, um, again, not required for admission, much in the same way that test scores are. Uh, so I would recommend to students if they have a letter that they would like to send us, they can. We will consider them for the Honors College. So although it does not have an impact on your general admission to the university, 
you are uh, welcome to submit a letter of recommendation to the Honors College or for scholarship consideration, we also offer appeals. So if you feel that your initial scholarship determination um, was missing information, then letters of recommendation are a great support for that. So speaking generally for our honors college, they do not have a specific um, subject that they're looking for. Again, this will vary by school. So please do reach out to uh, your representatives from the schools that you are applying to. But at Towson being a liberal arts university subject does not matter. Uh, I would encourage you to choose your recommender um, wisely. The best uh, recommender writing you a letter may not be your favorite teacher. It may not be the teacher that you've known the longest. It may not have been your favorite class. Um, I would encourage you to request a letter from someone who has seen you overcome or adapt to challenges, whether that be in the classroom or at a job, a mentorship relationship. But the reason we do not consider uh, letters of recommendation for admission is that we want to be cognizant of teachers' times. Um, in many of our counties, the student to teacher ratio um, simply makes it impossible for students to be able to equitably get letters to us. So if you have something you really want us to know, please do send it to us. But if you do not have letters, it will not um, negatively impact the way we review your application in any way. Thank you very much. And would any of you, any of you, uh, anybody else on the panel, would any of you like to chime in on this particular subject? I'll, I'll throw my two cents in, and this is just more, again, speaking for the system, which I tend to do. Uh, just being mindful that, again, for the nine UC campuses, Berkeley is the only campus that will accept that as a recommendation, um, unless it's a specialized program at one of the other schools. But we're the only ones. And again, we have to request them from you. Can You cannot just submit them to us. That is not an option on the application. That's not an error. That's why. So don't, and I say that just to say, don't stress yourselves out because I have students who feel like something's wrong because they don't see it. It's not an option. It's just that simple. So do not worry. I will say for us, if we do request them, two is our maximum. And we do not want more than just, we don't want more than two. I can clearly tell you that now with a hundred over, well over a hundred thousand applications. And we don't, we only ask for a certain percentage. That's a lot of work. So really try to stick to that too. Um, one has to be from a teacher for us. That's our one kind of default. The other individual could be a counselor, mentor, just no peer recommendation. So that really goes back to what's already been said of just following instructions. But I always like to kind of talk about that because it is very different than a lot of schools. And again, looking at a system, that can be very confusing sometimes. So just make sure that, so I want to make sure that you know that at the end of the day, again, feel free to ask us. If you're like, I do not remember this, we will please, we will definitely let you know. No worries there. Okay. Thank you very much. Lastly, financials. This is a big piece of college. So the first question on this is directed towards Brad at American. Please tell us what you're looking for on the FAFSA application and the CSS profile. A great question. Um, number one, looking for accuracy as much as possible. Um, granted, the FAFSA and the CSS profile are complicated. We understand that there will be times where uh, maybe you didn't understand what specific tax line the application was asking you for and you put in incorrect information, that's okay. As long as you are taking your time to go throughout the applications uh, and be intentional with the information that you're submitting, we'll get more accurate information than we would get inaccurate information. The great thing about the FAFSA is that it does have um, a series of help tools already built into it. So if you don't know exactly where to look on your tax return or other tax documentation, they will have examples for you uh, for each individual question on the FAFSA. So as you go through it step by step, you can get step by step assistance. The FAFSA also features the IRS data retrieval tool. So many families have the ability to directly transmit their tax information from the Internal Revenue Service into the FAFSA, and that removes uh, plenty of room for human error when it comes to transcribing that tax information. 
I highly recommend using the IRS data retrieval tool if it is available to you. It may not be though, based on how you filed your taxes in that particular year. So keep in mind that that is not a blanket statement, but if it is available, definitely try to use the uh, IRS data retrieval tool. The CSS profile is a little bit different in that it does not have the federal assistance built into the programming. So you're not going to be able to import data into the CSS profile from the IRS like you would be able to with the FAFSA. So being intentional again in reading through the questions carefully and making sure that you understand exactly where to look uh, will behoove you during the process of completing the FAFSA and the CSS profile. What I will say is that colleges and universities do have entire departments dedicated to helping you understand how financial aid works and how to apply for financial aid. So if you are uncertain about specific information that's being requested of you, or you feel that you've made a mistake, but you already hit submit, there are going to be individuals at these colleges and universities that can help you correct what you will have submitted. So keeping those lines of communication open uh, is very important, um, really across the board in the admissions process, but particularly in financial aid, to make sure that we have as much accurate information as possible when it comes to evaluating you and your family's financial aid eligibility. Another thing to keep in mind, um, which you may not have known, is that the FAFSA and the CSS profile do use prior prior year for evaluating your financial information, meaning that it looks at the tax information from two years ago when asking about your uh, family's financial eligibility. That means if something has changed within the last year or the past six months, the FAFSA and the CSS profile are not going to be asking about that. So it will be your responsibility as a family to notify any particular institution that there has been a change in circumstances that they will need to consider. And then they will advise you once you've identified that change in circumstances on what documentation will need to be submitted in order to uh, recalculate the information that has been used by the FAFSA and the CSS profile in the first place. Now, I will. I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, the the application, or I guess for the question itself, you know, what are we looking for? There's no specific info that we're looking for per se. Like we're not it's exclusively looking for students that have a specific expected family contribution range, which will play into the next couple of questions that we'll go over here. So the most important thing is making sure that the applications have been filed if you do intend to apply for need-based aid and making sure that they're as accurate as possible um, when you are submitting that information. Thank you very much. This next question is directed to Jua. Are you need blind? And if so, please explain what that means or the impact on the admissions process if you're not. Sure, great question. Um, we are need blind and need blind meaning that we do not consider your family's financial background, assets, um, worth any of those financial things uh, as a part of our admissions review. That is not anything that we consider as far as in that holistic review, that's not a part of it. Uh, so we are need blind from that uh, perspective. Um, so I always see it as a positive because I mean, again, it's it's open to all, um, again, to all of our applicants. Now, there are some schools that may be need aware um, and that's necessary, that's not a bad thing uh, because a lot of times when you have schools that are per se need aware, a lot of times it boils down to monies and what they can offer. So they're already in the mindset as if they offer you an admissions offer that a lot of times they're in a space, for instance, you have a lot of schools that are in a kind of a no loan space. So everything they offer you is going to be grant money, scholarship funds, meaning you're not hopefully not going to have any debt when you graduate, then it's going to be a major benefit. But they are thinking about that when they're reviewing their applicants, being aware of what is that the need going to be for their applicants, whether you are a domestic student, whether you are an international student, there are international students who will receive funding. So, you know, so need aware, need blind, that's kind of, you know, very two kind of terms that we utilize. And, it, and I will say, 
either one is not necessarily a good or bad thing. It's it just kind of it is. Um, but I do think part of that is just for you all that you know that Brad just talked about, it. and I think that, you know even in our conversations, I think to ask about you know NACAC fair and things of that nature. These are questions that you should be kind of compiling and asking this moving forward. And that's a great one because that's a family discussion. When it comes to financial piece, to me, that's about the family decision of where you're going to go to school. That's where everybody should be involved in understanding what that needs based on what you can afford. Um, you know, you may already have savings. Where do you need to go? Again, what makes sense for your family and for a student graduating without debt? And so those are questions that you need to ask. And as I think Matt said at the very beginning about, you know, we always say it depends. It does. And it will. And that this is going to be in the same space. And so the more that you ask that question, the more you'll be able to understand what those terms mean, need blind, need aware for the respective schools. And that'll give you a better understanding of what that means, again, and making those determinations, again, uh, as you're applying and again, what your financial aid uh, options, scholarship uh, options may be. Thank you. And lastly, for Caitlin at UMBC, can you please speak to any automatic merit aid or scholarships that you may offer? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for us, any student who applies early action, which we've talked about before, um, that's November 1st for us, will automatically receive merit scholarship consideration. Um, those scholarships for us can go up to $12,000 a year. It's going to vary depending on the pool. Um, but I do also want to mention uh, non-merit scholarships because I think that they are sometimes overlooked. Um, non-merit scholarships are not just based on academics. They also are not just institutional. So they can come from donors, they can come from organizations, and they can be for pretty much anything under the sun. So it can be a little overwhelming to try and find those. Many institutions do have portals that kind of compile non-merit scholarships so that students can apply to them a little bit more readily. Um, for us, it's scholarship retriever. Other schools will have different tools, but those are also really important. Um, merit scholarships, in many cases, you have to choose one or the other if you receive multiple. Non-merit scholarships, you can usually stack. So it's just another way to kind of optimize your financial planning. Um, it's money that you don't have to pay back, um, which we love. So really good opportunity there. Thank you very, very much. So I think that um, we are a little bit over time, but if there are any questions, I must say this panel has been phenomenal. And I so very much appreciate it. We all appreciate your taking the time to be with us this evening. Um, and your, your expertise is just amazing. So thank you very much. Um, I see there's gonna be something in here. You've also been fantastic about answering all of the chat questions. So thank you so much on that. And um, while I have your attention, the last bit is NACAC was mentioned, the NACAC Fair. Wooten will be attending the NACAC Fair on Tuesday, the 18th of April. We will go from 11 until 1. I have posted all of the information onto your administrator's website or, or webpage, excuse me, their, their tile. And um, I would love to get those permission slips back from our parents soon. Um, Additionally, we will be having several, several um, uh, workshops this summer that will cover financial aid, will cover the right college fit, et cetera. It will go into detail at that time. So thank you to all of our panel. Thank you to the families for joining us this evening. And I don't know if uh, Mrs. Markowitz has anything more to say or Mr. Rabin, but... Um, Please, I just want you. to thank everybody too and echo those same uh, sentiments. This panel has been phenomenal. I've learned so much and I've been doing this a long time and I'm always learning. And I just thank you for your time, for always answering questions, being available for us as staff members, as parents and guardians. We are so grateful to have you here this evening. Thank you parents and families for joining us um, and also asking such fabulous questions. And 
we know the counseling department is here to support your children in this journey. And we know it's confusing. Um, they experience a lot of different emotions and we support them and care for them very much so um, throughout this process. So thank you again. Thank you all very much. We appreciate I, it. I, I want to echo the thanks to our counseling office and to our panelists. So thank you all very much. I hope everybody has a great spring break. We look forward to seeing you at the April uh, meeting and uh, hopefully at the 50th anniversary celebration. So thank you all. Have a great night.